TV. We have Chaplain Butts on from Mansfield, Ohio. I've been talking about this gentleman for a while and how we're going to speak about just on prison industrial complex, just the prison in general, and how churches need to be involved in ministry. Chaplain, I don't think a lot of people know the um, that they're over a little, I think a little over 2 million people that are incarcerated in the United States of America. And there's a large majority of them that are minorities. And um, a lot of people don't understand that when you start dealing with spirituality and religion, that Islam, the Hebrew Israelite, the comedic doctrine and various things are flowing very strongly. A lot of brothers have come to Islam in America through the prison system because they've been involved in different ways with the prison system or being on parole, being on probation, and Islam and different religions are heavily involved in evan evangelizing in the prisons and yeah. being incarcerated. Um, what do you do as a chaplain? Tell us about yourself and what you do as a chaplain. Those are kind of two questions, but if you can answer that for us. Okay, I'll just give a little brief background on myself. Um, my full name is Damon Butts. Um, I'm a native of Mansfield, Ohio, as you mentioned. I'm a graduate of Ashland University. Um, I'm happily married to an amazing wife um, mm -hmm. by the name of Ursula Butts. Um, this past June covered 23 years of marriage between amen, us. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, amen. And she's amen. an anointed praise and worship leader. She's highly anointed to doing that. Amen. Um, she's also a breast cancer and a domestic violence survivor. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm also, All right. Amen. I'm also the father of three children, the grandfather of three grandchildren. Um, I attend New Birth Christian Ministries in Columbus, Ohio, with mm. Kenneth Moore as the pastor. Um, I've been employed um, in the prison system for the state of Ohio for over 23 years. Oh, um, you've been doing this for a while. Yes, I'm a veteran, as they call me. Um, okay. My first five years, I actually did that in the Department of Youth Services, so the juvenile prison system. Mm -hmm. And then I transferred over into the adult system in the last 17 years I've been there. Um, I've been a correctional officer, social worker, case manager, and in 2010, I became a chaplain at the prisons. All right, that's great. Um, I'm also big on teaching apologetics. As you know, um, I'm a student in your Sunday seminary class, which is awesome. Um, I'm also a coach. Um, I coached um, varsity basketball as a strength and conditioning coach. I'm currently a track and field coach at Mansfield Senior High School when I work with the boys and girls. And I generally have a passion to teach people about Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Amen. And you asked about my function as a chaplain. Um, yeah, what does a chaplain, what does a chaplain do? A lot of us, we, you know, we're, we're not too sure about that. Uh, okay. what, what, is, what is the role of a chaplain, especially with men that are incarcerated, men or women? Do you deal with women also? No, I'm strictly you know? work at a male prison. Um, mm -hmm. I've never worked in a female prison. So um, although I do deal with females from a different perspective in prison ministry, and I'll describe that. Okay. Um, as a chaplain, I provide spiritual care for the offenders, um, family of offenders, staff, and family of staff members. So that's how I may deal with females. Um, sometimes I get a chance to talk to or minister or um, counsel family members of offenders. Sometimes mothers, grandmothers, wives call in, and they're struggling with their loved one doing time. And mm. sometimes it takes a toll on them. So that's where I come in a lot. They'll talk to me and kind of open up to me. Um, sometimes it's very emotional with them. And I'm just sitting there trying to be a source of comfort for them. And so they can let somebody know, let them know like, hey, um, you know, just try to keep yourself together as much as possible, you know, and, and, and try to keep praying and, and try to just stay focused on some things in your particular life also. And, um, I think uh, and I think that's important. Excuse me for cutting you off. I think that's okay. important because a lot of people don't know when they um they're involved in this trap life and you're out there in the streets and you're doing whatever. When you're when you're arrested, when you're convicted of a crime, you blow trial. However, whatever happens, when you go away, you're not the only one doing time. Exactly. That's what they would say. You're not the only one doing time. It's your children that miss you and um, your wife, your parents. And a lot of guys, I know their parents die whilst they're in there. And yes. that really breaks them in their spirit and stuff because they're in there doing time. And whilst they're doing time, they lose family members. And exactly. Stuff. I'm sorry. Go ahead now. That's okay. And you just kind of hit on one of the areas I deal with. Um, we deal with a lot of death notices in prison mm. um, through the chaplain. And that is some of the most 
uh, emotional and traumatic things for the offender and family. Mm. Um, you have a lot. Um, I deal with that every day. I just dealt with that today. Dealt with it yesterday. I got to deal with it again tomorrow. Setting up phone calls and um, you know, for the offender to find out one of his loved ones passed away and he feels helpless at that time, and that's where his incarceration becomes even more real. Mm. And they kind of look at themselves like, "Wow, what have I put myself in this situation? You know, I can't help my mom." or someone's terminally ill and they get that call, hey, grandma has terminal cancer, stage four cancer, and have um, only a few months to live, or they get the phone call where, hey, we're gonna have to pull the plug, and do you wanna say your last goodbyes to mm. your loved one mm. who, who's basically unconscious or not or not conscious? And you have to and, say it over phone. Yes, they have to say it over phone. Yes, a lot of them have to say it over phone. And, you know, um, that's when it gets real where they, uh, they realize, you know, my choice in life, not just hurt me, it hurt my family and anyone who loves me. Yeah. Um, yeah so that gets very, that gets very tough. Um, we all, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Um, we also do, I deal with preaching, I deal with teaching, I deal with counseling, mentoring. So you, you actually run the services in there? Yes, I run the service. We do have a lot of volunteers that come in, but um, as a chaplain, I run the service. Sometimes I'll preach and sometimes we'll have the vol some of the guest volunteers that come in and preach like that and teach. Now, and now that's that's interesting. Now, why I, I want to ask you why do you feel more churches should be involved? Because I deal with a lot of ex offenders, even offenders that leave out and they call me back. I get a lot of who have been impacted, and I, I'll share. There's a gentleman he doesn't mind me using his name. Mm -hmm. His name is Keith Bill. He lived in Dayton, Ohio. He did ten and a half years in the prison system. I was his case manager for so many years, but I developed a good rapport with him. Um, he, after he got out and got his life together, he told me he wanted to come back into prison to speak to the offenders. So he got his life together, had a business started, and came back in as a speaker and a volunteer to speak to the offenders. And some of the guys still knew him because, hey, I remember him when he was incarcerated. But he talked about how the prison ministry, the those came in, the, those who came in from the outside really uplifted him and helped him out and made him, let him see what it's like to see godly people. You know, I was his case manager and I was clergy, so he told me that I was the first Christian black godly man that he's ever saw. So mm -hmm. that set a standard for him, you know, and he would ask me questions about my family, you know, not personal, but just say, how do you as a man deal with situations like this? How do you deal with situations with your kids? And I would give him information and advice on that. And he took a lot of information from what I gave him and from what those who were involved in prison ministry gave him. And he put that in, um, in effect when he got out and he got a lot of restoration back with his family. Excellent, excellent, excellent. That's, 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 that's great. That's great stuff to hear. Um, but let me ask you a question. Other people that want to get involved, young people, ministers, you say you were a correction officer and a counselor prior to that. Someone that feels um, that, that has a desire to be involved in the chaplaincy, what do they have to go through? Can you ex kind of explain the steps to us or an, another church, a minister that wants to get his church involved? How, how can they go about that? Maybe you can oh. kind of explain that process for us. Okay. Now, I think the first question you asked was, how does someone become a chaplain? Is that correct? Yes. How can you? Yes. Okay. For the state of Ohio, to become a chaplain, you have to, first of all, have some type of ecclesiastical endorsement which means your church has to basically like have a like licensing of ordination as a minister or an elder. You have to have that. Already. Big, right, yes. And the big thing you have to have is at least one unit of clinical pastoral education, which they call it CPE. If you don't have the CPE, you will not be hired as a chaplain. That is mandatory. And clinical pastoral education, you can only get those currently, I know in Ohio, in a certain hospital. And they have a CPE program that you have to enroll in, and it has to be an accredited one that you enroll in. They take up to uh, 10 to 12 months to mm -hmm. complete those. You're there, and it's like you are an intern chaplain at a hospital. You go through classes. You go through lots of training. You um, have small groups. We do uh, verbatims, and we're critiqued a lot in front of other uh, spiritual leaders, and you meet with all kinds of various patients in the hospital, you have to, it's just, it's, it's very uh, extensive. Mm. Um, you deal with a lot of death, you deal with um, end of life issues, you deal with um, kids, even end of life issues with kids. Mm. Um, you deal with a lot of stuff. I've seen people with 
um, bones sticking out their legs, people uh, limbs cut mm. off, mm. and people want to talk with you even when they're going through this sometimes. They still want to talk. Right, yeah, because sometimes they're struggling and dealing with a lot of situations, and some of them are like, I don't believe I'm sick, I'm in the hospital, and they don't have family coming to see them. And, like, and it's, it's a lot. You know, I learned so much in CPE that it had changed some things about my life and how I, put, and how I engage in ministry. Now, even, even, I'm sorry, even though you were involved in correction, you still had to go through that anyway. It's not like you slid through the back door because you no. were involved in corrections anyway. No. You still had I, to go through the entire process. When, I, when there was a chaplain job opener in another prison I applied for, it, they told me you need CPE. I said, hey, I got all this training. I, and I have extensive training. They said, and but you still, do not have CPE. So I had to go back and get the CPE. And I was still working full time and still going to CPE class and then doing my um, rounds and extra work outside of class. So, and I had to go an hour away for my CPE class. So it, it, was, it was very, very extensive. Uh, driving in the winter, driving in the snow, driving, you know, uh, staying, uh, staying the night over at the hospital. Um, you're on call sometimes 24 hours and you have to stay up all night. And you deal with, um, you know, uh, the worst thing I've done was I had to, had to hold a stillborn baby. And that right there just blew my mind right there. Oh, that's a lot. It's a lot. It's more than um, it's more than a lot of us can even imagine. That's how I'm, I'm glad that we're doing this interview. I remember reading um, The New Jim Crow. That's Michelle Alexander, I believe her name is. Okay. The New Jim Crow, and she spoke about um, the prison system. You hear a lot of people talking about the prison industrial complex. Um, recently, a few months back, there was an article on that people started circulating or posting on Facebook that there was a judge. He would sentence minorities very harshly, mm -hmm. but when things found, when, when you know, it came to light eventually, and he got 28 years in prison right. for it, that he was a part of the privatization of prisons. He was part of a private prison, and he was getting paid for sentencing them and exactly. keeping the prison 98% full. Um, like Michelle Alexander stated in the book, do you believe that this is the new Jim Crow. This is some type of new form of slavery. How do you personally feel about that as a chaplain? Um, well, first, I have not read Michelle Alexander's book. It is one I'm going to get to read. I had another chaplain actually recommend it to me and say, hey, you think this is something you would like to see? Mm -hmm. but, but from my personal experience, um, let me just share this. Um, I used to study a lot about slavery. Mm -hmm. And the thing about slavery is I think there is no other heinous act in the history of this planet that was worse than slavery. I agree 100%. And I mean, and I was in, I studied slavery so detailed that my eyes watered up to seeing mm -hmm. what, what happened to our ancestors. Amen. So with that in mind, I can't compare anything else to what they call the transatlantic slave trade or, or as some refer correctly, the African Holocaust. That's correct. That's what I, I, I can't see anything lining up with that even the prison system. And you know, although there are some things in the prison system that at a cursory glance, you can see that may resemble some things about slavery, I still can't put it on that level of slavery. And I'll share why. Um, there are, I, like I mentioned, I've been doing this for 23 years. I also was a chaplain over death row and I have had to witness two executions. Mm -hmm. I also buried inmates that end up dying in prison from old age. So I had, we have a cemetery out back of our prison I had to bury inmates out there and do perform the rites and to bury them. Um, one thing I found out and I realized that in my years of being in corrections, there are some offenders who deserve to be in prison. Mm. Um, I know some people kind of shy, kind of have an issue when I say that, but when I'm dealing with offenders who tell me, if I get out, I'm going to reoffend. Mm. I have in, offenders who are on my caseload and I ask, why did you commit the murder? They mentioned, I woke up one morning and said, somebody's gonna die at my hand today. I just don't know who it is. Mm. These were guys that some of them were locked up in prison. Now I'm not saying everybody in prison deserves to be there because there are some we found out who've gotten, who uh, one uh, got some things overturned. Oh, and, exactly. Exact, exact, and got out because they were innocent. Yes. But the majority that are in there did a crime. Now, mm -hmm. I will say that sometimes the sentencing does not match the crime, yes. and that is an issue, but most of them have done crimes. Um, I, as I mentioned, I worked in the juvenile system, 
And I see guys who were in the juvenile system also in the adult system, the same guys. Hmm. And some of them make comments like to me, Mr. Bush, you helped raise me. These guys were 14 years old when they came in the system and they're still in the system in their 30s. So the majority of their life, I seen them and dealt with them. And some of them will confess, hey, I committed a lot of crimes. Some of them even said, hey, if I would have been caught for the crimes that I really committed, some mm. of the other ones I committed, mm. I would have got more time or I'd be on death row. I, I, there's some things I got away with. Now, now, let me go back to slavery with that. I mentioned that there are some people that deserve to be in prison. I can't say there's anybody that ever deserved to be in slavery. Oh, I got you. No one to me has ever, just, no one, I can't justify slavery in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But and again, slavery for life also. Exactly, life. exactly. Mm -hmm. And I can justify, though, some people being in prison. And I ran groups and I told some offenders, you don't deserve to go home yet. You're not ready, man. If you go home, you're going to cause more damage. You're going to damage your kids. You're going to damage your spouse. You're going to damage your mother. Some of them have come back after being upset me and admitted, you're right. I'm not ready to be productive to my family. I'm not ready to be a father to my kids. Mm. So that's where I'm coming from. I know we talk about the privatization and the, and the money involved in that, and you mentioned about the judge. Yeah, that does exist. Not in all areas, but it definitely exists, and we know there's some that have been caught and there's some that probably should be caught. Mm -hmm. However, again, I can't compare that to slavery when I'm reading about what they did to the African. I just can't see that. You know, no half, right. You know, half our volunteers in religious services are ex-offenders. Mm -hmm. These are, are people who got out, got their life together, and want to come back in and make an impact in prison. I've never seen that happen in slavery. People get out and want to come back in. Mm -hmm. but, you know, so from that perspective, I can't compare the two. I and like I said, I'm, I'm going to read Michelle Alexander's book, but it, I feel in some ways it still will not change my view because of what I've seen and what I. Uh, have um, experienced in prison where I've seen people come in to minister and help change lives of people. I've literally seen guys do 180s in prison where they were gang banging, fighting, doing everything else, and they did a 180. And people that don't even, the COs, a correction officer, don't even recognize, man, what happened to this person? He's a whole nother person. He went from being our worst offender to now one of our best offenders now. Mm -hmm. You know, and to see, to hear the family when the family hears about this. When the wife or the mother or grandmother hears that their loved one has made a change, to hear the joy in their voice, amen, amen. and sometimes they come for visits, and to see the one lady, we did a baptism service in our church, and we did it, we had what's called family day at the prison, mm -hmm. and we invited the family members of the candidates who were being baptized, and I remember the one mother, the, when her son went down in the water and came up, she broke out screaming and crying. Mm. And saying, this is the day I've been praying for. Mm. My prayer has been answered. My son has got his life together. Bless your name. Then the sister and all, and then and, and the offender himself, they all hugged and they were just all crying. Yeah. I said, man, that was wonderful, man. And this guy has been doing well since then. That's good. That's a blessing. And, and it's near and dear to my heart. A lot of people, they don't know my whole story. You're in Sunday seminary with myself. I've shared some of it, but being that I have so many videos out and I know how people would take and twist things around, but I, um, the reason I'm involved in apologetics today, I grew up in church, but the reason that I'm involved in apologetics and so heavy into it, and I have so much knowledge of the conscious community and Islam, Nation of Islam, Freemasonry, is because I spent time in prison. Exactly. Uh, in and out. I think I spent five years all together, two years, mm -hmm. 18 months, 10 month violation, in and out, Rikers Island, life just crazy. And um, the Bible says a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Exactly. So in, in, in with me being in and out of there, I rededicated my life to Christ. And that's how I, you know, and when I look back on it now, I begin to understand that all my time reading those books and people coming to me and seeing me, why are you reading the white man's book? Mm -hmm. That just got me into the, you know, I have to defend what I believe. Lord, I'm in my cell and I'm praying to you and I'm sensing your spirit and you're speaking to me, but they're telling me you're not real. They're, exactly. telling, me, they're telling me you're my higher self and all of this crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah. So that's, how I, that's how I got into apologetics. And gotcha. I laugh at young people that, oh, well, you need to read Ivan Van Sertima. I'm in there for 
hundreds and hundreds of days with nothing but hundreds and hundreds of books. So exactly. when we talk about Van Sertima and Diop and Finch and Book of the Dead, Pyramid, all of that stuff, 5% lessons, I had all of that in my cell for years with me, reading it over and over. So when people think, oh, Berean, he's some college-educated seminarian graduate. No, my, my seminary was in a cell. Exactly. Seminary and on my knees and spending time with the Lord and that's how, um, you know, that's kind of Berean story. But um, let me ask you a question before, you know, before we wrap it up. One of the most important things to me, how, what can young people do? What do you see that's a common thread? A lot of people said it was the lack of male, male um, figures in the household. How can young people avoid the prison system? Maybe you can speak to us about that being an insider or someone that's actually in there. Now that you're explaining what a chaplain does, I, um, you basically you're an inside pastor. You're yeah, a pastor exactly. for those that are locked down. Exactly. You're running yeah. a church, you're, you're, you're counseling family members and inmates, and you're, do you marry also? No, we don't marry. Mm -hmm. um, we have what, how the marriage system works in the prison system for the state of Ohio. They have outside clergy that we have lists of that they can get in touch with, and they can, it's a certain packet they fill out, and with information, they have outside clergy that come in that actually perform the marriage ceremonies. We don't, they don't want us to do that because they feel that's too close. Oh, to, um, oh I got you. Right, right. And if something goes wrong, you know, they don't want us to fall with that. Yes. But we do do marriage counseling. I mean, I, I've had a lot of offenders come and talk to me about marriage. Married um, or getting ready to get married, pre-marriage counseling or couples that's Both, married. both, both. I've had both. I've had guys tell me, I'm thinking about getting married. You know, what do, what should I do? And how can I be a real man? And how can I, you know, just tell me about marriage? Because as you know, there's no true, there's no manual marriage, real, no real manual not marriage. Not but, a but I try, always come from a, uh, try to come from a scriptural perspective and, mm -hmm. and talk about the importance of what it means to be a man, you know, and, 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 it's, and it's universal the way I talk about it because I've talked to those who are Christian, who are Muslim, who are Jehovah Witnesses, who are pagan, who mm -hmm. are um, uh, Hebrew Israelite. I've talked to so many guys about things like that, you know, what it means to be a man. You know, mm -hmm. and, and how to be a father to the kids because some guys don't understand what it means to be a father because, again, they never had a role model of being a father in their lives. So that's one thing I do as a chaplain. And you mentioned, yes, um, a lot of the offenders call me pastor now. Mm -hmm. I, actually re I actually rejected it at first. Mm -hmm. and, and no, that's I, what you are. That's what and, you are. Right. And I was kind of rejecting it. And I, a clergy on the outside of the streets, I know he said, man, you know you're a pastor. And I said, you know, I'm not big on the title. And so one guy called me, Pastor, I said, you don't have to call me that. And this guy looked me in the eye with tears in his eyes. He said, you don't understand. You are. You are the only pastor that some of us have ever had in their mm. life. Mm. And after that, I said, call me Pastor, man. I'm, I'm fine yeah, with that. Yeah, you know? that's what it is, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so the other part of that question was, what, what can they do? What can they do? Parents, what can parents do? What can young people do to try to avoid that trap? Well, let me give a couple stats, if it's okay, about just about prison please, in general, please. because I think this is, will highlight some things. What I found out is that, according to the Bureau of Justice, offenders have a five-year recidivism rate of 76.6%. Hmm. Um, we find out that the National Institute of Justice states that a three-year recidivism, three recidivism rate of 67.8%. One's approximately three fourths, the other one's approximately two thirds. So what it's saying is two thirds of those who go out, or three fourths of those who go out, are going to come back into prison system. That's an alarming rate. That's an alarming. Um, but we find that um, there's not really one reason why people go to prison. There's various reasons. So I tell people you can't just focus on one reason because everybody has a different situation. Some people are committing a life of crime and they've been doing it for years. Other people get caught up in one, a, moment, a one moment situation that could change the rest of their lives. They've never had sentences before. They've never been in trouble with the law. Mm. Um, but one incident, a guy comes home and he finds his wife cheating on him with another man. He goes off, uh, he plots and goes off and kills him. He plots, he plots and plans to kill him. Mm. And he ends up coming into prison for that. His guy had a master's degree, never been in trouble before. But then you have those who are perpetual. Um, they have a, what, a long list of being incarcerated. They've been, since they were 10 years old, they've been getting in trouble. So you have to look at those two different ways right there. Okay. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King said something years ago. He said, poverty, ignorance, and disease will breed crime, whatever the racial group may be. 
He said, so when you deal with poverty, ignorance, and disease, crime will manifest itself. There's also something I found out that youth who are at risk for dropping out of school and engaging in criminal activity have something with the parents that are similar. They find the parents did not read to them when they were young. Um, the parents did not effectively interact with them. They didn't show a lot of interest in them. The parents did not attend school events that the kids were involved in. The parents did not try to enroll their kids in extracurricular activities. If they did, they didn't show up. They don't ask their children about their homework. They don't prioritize education. And sometimes they don't even supervise their kids. They let the kids go what they want to do, what they want to do. I, I think you might have to report. I think you may have to um, repeat that right there. Okay. Well, let, let, me, let me hear that one more time. Okay. They said youth who are at risk for dropping out and engaging in criminal activity typically have similar actions from parents. And those actions are many of the parents did not read to their kids when they were young. Hmm. They didn't effectively interact with their children, talk with them, or show interest in what the kid was doing. And you know when people don't show interest, the kids are going to look for interest somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, they did not attend school events with their children. Um, I mentioned I coach, and sometimes kids go through a whole season and parents don't show up for nothing. Mm -hmm. And you can see how it affects the kids. The kids get bitter. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they won't allow their kids to be enrolled in extracurricular activities. They don't ask their children about their homework. They don't prioritize education for their children. And sometimes they don't even supervise their kids. And they said that the kids that who are in prison and the kids who drop out of school, those are the similar things that happen to them. Mm -hmm. When it also says that about 65% of federal inmates are high school dropouts. Hmm. Dropouts are 3.5 times more likely than high school graduates to be incarcerated in their lifetime. So now that lets me go back to what we say what the young people can do. First of all, the parents need to value their children from a godly perspective. That's the first thing I said. They have to raise their children in a godly perspective, a way, care for them, and then be godly acting themselves. Parents have to parent. They just can't let their kids do what they want to do. They can't be their kids' best friend. They have to sometimes display discipline. I know discipline in today's society is not always the greatest thing like that. But, uh, you know, I still tell people, sometimes you got to go there with them, you know, put the punishment. I still say sometimes the whipping still work if you do them the proper way. Damn, you got to tell them. You know, and but what I find out is a lot of parents want to be friends instead of parents to their kids. Mm. Um, parents have to provide appropriate adult involvement. And notice I said appropriate adult involvement. I didn't say adult involvement because some parents are not good for their kids. So I've seen some parents, we've had, I've seen athletes where we've had on our team where a parent would get out of prison and the child would go downhill with, mm. the, with the sports attitude, everything. And as long as the parent was a car, the child was actually functional, functional and did very well. But this parent was a negative influence in that child's life. And so I, when I say appropriate parent involvement, they have to show love. They have to set proper guidelines. They have to know how to correct. They have to be responsible and be there in a proper way. Know when to build up. Know when to discipline. But, you know, being there in a proper support, showing them love the proper way. Um, next thing, people have to watch the kind of company they keep the young folk, young and old. You know, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10 through 19 talks about, um, it goes, it says, my son, if sinners entice you, don't consent. And then it goes on to talk about how they're trying to lead this person into a life of crime. And it, in, in the psalm, in the, uh, in the writer keeps saying, my son, don't walk in your way. And it still keeps talking about them leading them into this life of crime. But here's the key, what at the end it says. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. Hmm. So it says, basically, if you follow people who are doing negative things, it's going to take away your life eventually. And that's what happens when they go to prison. They get a lot of their life taken away, or most of it or some of it. And even though some of them get out, they don't know how to function. Hmm. Hmm. You know, so those are some things that many need to do. When it comes down to that, we, uh, they need to, first of all, like I said, uh, I would say keep God first. Have parents who are going to keep God first. Um, have appropriate adult involvement. Also, watch the company you keep. And also, education. Education, as I mentioned, I gave some stats on the education part, but here's some more stats. It says that increasing the high school completion rate by 1% from all men ages 20 to 60 would save the United States $1.4 billion annually and reduce costs 
associated with crime. Mm, mm, mm. So just they're saying, one, pardon? Just 1%. Just 1%. Would mm. save the country $1.4 billion just in essence dealing with crime. Another says almost 60, 66% of federal inmates are high school dropouts. In fact, dropouts are more are 3.5 times more likely than high school graduates to be incarcerated in their lifetime. So that just lets us know that if we can just also provide the education and proper education, we can change a lot just with the corrections. I know when um, we have a, a Ash University inside our prison, and most of the guys that go through there, they do not come back into prison. Mm. Education is important, very education important. Education is very important, you know, um, but we have to get these guys out that mentality that education is something bad, and something evil. We, all, we also need teachers and mentors who are passionate about what they do. Like we said, when we talk about the church coming in, the people have to be passionate when they want to come into the prison to, to uh, minister to the offenders. If they're not passionate, it's not going to mean anything. They're going to see right through it. You know, so I always tell people when you come into, uh, when you, I, tell, I thank all my volunteers and say, hey, I thank you for coming in because you don't understand the impact that you make on some of these guys. And I share some stories with some of them because I say, y'all, many of you don't hear the success stories. I got offenders sometimes calling me back and asking about certain volunteers saying, and tell them thank you when you see them. They really minister to me. I've seen um, those who are coming from different walks of life. We have a lot of our volunteers also from the suburbs. And most mm -hmm. of our, a lot of our clientele and prisoners from the inner city. But mm -hmm. some of those are from the suburb come in, they really have a passion to work with those offenders and they've been effective. And they've been you effective. Know, been That's very effective. effective. And you know, that was a, lot key. Of people, a lot of people don't know that I actually started the Sunday seminary because I wanted to get some some tools in the hands of, of brothers that were in there that were believers, not so much not so much Bibles, because there are a lot of Bibles, you know, yeah. we have Gideon and we have different organizations that give them out, but um, commentaries, concordances to teach them how. I know that was very important to me when I was doing word studies, when I'm studying exactly. expositorial preaching and teaching and, and stuff like that. And um, so Certain other tools were important. So that's why I originally started the Sunday seminary so I can get people to give donations and give concordances like the strong, the young concordance. Exactly. So I can send to brothers that I know are in there because I know how much it helped me. A lot of people say, oh, they're just in there and they're just doing that to pass time. But, you know, um, a lot of them get out. Like you, like you said, a lot of people, they don't hear success stories. And I think that's very important for us to know. Let me ask you a question, if you don't mind. Can you tell them how to get in touch with you in case um, there are people that's elders in the church, people that's involved that don't know too much, but just need a little guidance? Do you have a Twitter or a Facebook or do you have some way, email or something that people can get in touch with you? Yes, um, definitely my Facebook. I'm Damon Butts on, on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. So that's pretty simple. Uh, my email is DamonButts1 at gmail.com. Again, DamonButts1 at gmail.com. And so um, those are the two main ways to get in touch with me. Um, they both go to my phone, so it's pretty easy. But can I share something else? Um, please, please do. Um, I, I think I mentioned to you, we have a gentleman who comes from Brooklyn, New York, that does prison ministry in Ohio, um, Pastor David Butler. Um, mm -hmm. He's out of St. Mary's Church of God in Christ in Brooklyn, New York. He comes and he started a Bible college at our prison. Mm -hmm. And he brings the concordances and a lot of commentary into oh, the Bible man. class. So, and he's very passionate. He's brought people from different states to come in to teach. Uh, we had a Dr. Sandra Smith, who from Houston, Texas, he brought her in. She did time in the New York State Penitentiary. Got mm -hmm. out, got her life together, got a PhD, and wrote a book. And that's part of, that was one of the curriculum books in the Bible college class. She came and talked to the sessions of the Bible college. Mm. You know, he's brought people from Philadelphia, from Jacksonville, Florida. He's donated an organ to us, a Hammond B3 organ he donated them, mm. and had it shipped from New York. And the guy came from New York to set it up. Wow. So, you know, he's very creative. He's donated computers to us. He's done so much. And he's like what I call the, the, the superhero of prison ministry. Mm. You know, he um, he was also awarded our volunteer of the year because everybody was amazed. This guy came from New York. And he comes. He was coming every month till he got sick. He had a heart attack and stroke. He's a medical miracle. He wasn't supposed to be alive. He's alive and he looks like he's never been through anything now. 
So he comes every he never so he comes every other month now. But I really appreciate him and his wisdom. And he's very knowledgeable about so much things and he brings information about even the prison system and how it relates to the offender. And then the mm -hmm. spiritual part. And he talks about the economic part, like, hey guys, you learn how to budget your your, your account. You need to get a bank account and learn how to budget it. Here's how you save money. Here's how you communicate with people. He mm -hmm. teaches all these types of skills, which, you know, I think that's the thing the church has to focus on, not just coming in to preach. We get that a lot, but we need, how, does, uh, how do you teach someone to be a better husband? How do they teach communication skills? How do they sit down with the interview? We have another gentleman who was in prison named Bill Robinson. He lives in Columbus, Ohio. He has a nonprofit organization that's helping out offenders and at-risk people and at-risk youth um, to um, better themselves. He has a nonprofit organization that when offenders get out, he provides suits and training for them so they can do interviews sometimes like that. You know? mm. So, and, and, you know, he and I, we, we attended a church for a while together and he still comes back in and he wrote three books that he donated to our library, you know, mm. about his life story and testifying how he used to sell drugs and now how he's overcome that and got God in his life. And now he's positively in the city, in the inner city, helping kids out, um, helping pro having all kinds of typical programs down in the Columbus, Ohio area. So those are some of the three people I mentioned that are doing things that we, I say churches need to do more of. You know, we need more African-Americans involved in prison ministry, unfortunately. And fortunately, um, you know, the, the bulk of the prison system, the faces are African-American. That's right. But the bulk of the volunteers are not African-American. Say that again. Uh, the face, the, the majority of the faces in prison are African-American, but the majority of the volunteers that come in are not African-American. Mm, mm, and mm. some of them have asked, why don't more churches that look like us come in here? I've had people ask me that. We as chaplains have even talked about that. Mm, you know, mm. I'm not trying to say um, you have to come in, uh, uh, you know, every day. You know, we have a couple other guys, uh, Elder Thomas McLean, Elder Lester Clancy, their local in Mansfield, they come and do a Bible study every Tuesday faithfully. Uh, both of them, Church of God in Christ, they come in faithfully, do that Bible study, and the offenders love them. Mm -hmm. but, they're, they're, but they're very committed to what they do. And like, again, if you come in with a good heart, and you're consistent, and you come in and really try to teach and show love, you'll be received pretty well in prison. Because mm. the guys, they want someone to come in that's real. If you fake, they're going to see right through it. That's they will right. see right through it. And right. that, that has happened. Some people got exposed. But the ones who you know, are passionate coming in, all I say is you just have to have a time and passion and, and um, the resiliency to come in. Now, if you want to be a part of prison ministry, I'd say you need to get in touch with the chaplain of that appropriate prison. Um, there's usually paperwork that needs to fill out. Fill that out. Um, they're going to do a background check on you somewhat, shape, form, or fashion. Mm -hmm. um, there's training that needs to be completed. There's some training is mandatory that you have to do, and bring whatever skill sets you have into the prison. That's right. I, you, you don't have to preach. Some people come in. We've had people come in and teach guys how to sew bags together and make blankets that mm -hmm. they donated to cancer patients. Mm -hmm. And the guys were so uh, like, man, you taught me a skill set that's helping somebody else. And have a heart for the population. You and do have those a heart things. For the population. You gotta have it, brother. You gotta have Man, it. Man, we appreciate having you. Just on um, you. Give your information one more time. Oh, um, for what it takes to be involved in prison ministry. No, no, just, just. You, I'm you, sorry. You to contact you, you know, for questions because I know people will text me and hit me and ask me questions, <laughs> and this is not my lane here. That's no problem. Give them your contact info one more time. Uh, my Facebook is Damon Butts. Uh, my email is Damon Butts one at gmail.com. Okay, and y'all been watching Berean TV, 